jumping into week two of our brand new series that we're calling Kryptonite. Kryptonite. And for anybody who doesn't know, uh, Kryptonite comes from probably the most well-known superhero ever. DC Comics, Superman. Superman. Now, Kryptonite itself is actually this fictional rock, right? This radioactive mineral from Superman's home planet of Krypton. And the crazy thing about Kryptonite is what happens when Superman gets anywhere near it. When Superman gets anywhere near Kryptonite, this normally buff, like, swole stud of a superhero loses his superpowers. Like, he can barely stand. He gets so weak. And just like the fictional Kryptonite, there are certain things in reality in our lives that can make us weak, that can take us down spiritually. And today, we're going to be talking about, we're going to be focusing on the kryptonite that is at the core of weakening and taking down our marriages. And not just marriages, but really this will apply to almost any relationship that really matters. So whether you're currently married or not, my encouragement for you right now is throughout this message just to kind of lean into God's wisdom throughout this message. Because what you'll come to find out is God's wisdom is a lot like buckshot. It, it, it spreads out and it hits multiple targets at the same time. That's just how God works. So I've got a buddy who's from the south, from Georgia, and he reminds me of this every now and again. He says, man, marriage is like flies on a screen door. The ones on the outside, one in, and the ones on the inside, one out. So I want to start out this morning. I want to ask the ladies a question, all right? So I really need your participation, all right, ladies? So how many of you ladies, when you were a little girl, when you were growing up, You dreamed of like the perfect wedding day, right? You dreamed of your wedding gown and maybe a tiara. You dreamed of a perfect home. Maybe your Prince Charming carrying you over the threshold into your perfect home. Maybe you even like wrote down names for your future children when you were a little girl. How many of you ladies, be honest and participate. How many of you ladies did anything like that? Raise them up. Okay, lots of you. Lots of you. Okay, guys, if you did anything like that, don't raise your hand, please. See me after worship. We'll talk about kind of revoking your man card until we can get that straightened out, all right? All right, now for the guys, for the men in the house, all right, seriously, how many of you dreamed of one day getting married and and, and making love twice a day, three times on Sunday? Raise your hands. Come on. Yes. Praise God, my men, right? All right, one more question. How many of you are still dreaming? Raise them up. Raise them up. Yes. All right, all right. Everybody should be raising their hands. My point is, we have a lot of expectations about marriage, right? And we think about these things, or we thought about these things. What's marriage going to be like one day? And then a lot of the times what happens is reality, the reality of marriage, doesn't quite connect. It doesn't dovetail. It doesn't meet up to those expectations. And when that happens, there's all sorts of letdowns, disappointments, hurts, Pain, anger, bitterness, even divorce, right? In fact, I know that there's a lot of you right now because I've talked to you and I've met with you and I've heard about this. Many of you right now, you've been deeply wounded through some previous relationships that you have. And there are actually some of you right now that you're in a relationship that's in such bad shape that you honestly, you find yourself kind of backing up and asking the question, is a good marriage even possible? Like maybe marriage in and of itself is like my kryptonite. So there's a lot of people, they find themselves in that place where it's like, is is a healthy marriage, is a good marriage, is that even reality? Is that possible? And I want to answer you this morning, beyond a shadow of a doubt, emphatically, the answer is yes, it's possible. But it's not likely. It's not likely. I want to be honest and tell you, it's not likely if you do what everybody else in our culture does, if you follow the rank and file. A great marriage is possible, but it's not likely if you simply do what everybody else is doing. Because if you just kind of look at the statistics, and we're going to real quick, they're horrifying. I think the the important number to take away from this is the number 50. 50 50% statistics say 50% of the marriages that start will not make it. And I know that many of you have probably heard that before. You've tucked that away. You know that. The tragedy is, is that in the United States today, 2018, 
The younger you marry, the less likely you are to make it, the less likely your marriage is to succeed. And of those 50% or more that, that do succeed, that do make it, they're usually miserable. They're usually miserable. They're kind of just sticking together for the sake of the children or for the sake of the finances, right? Or it's just easier to kind of endure a spouse who's become more of a roommate than it is to kind of step into the unknown or to ask for help. And so the odds are really stacked against us if we just kind of follow the, the line and do what everybody else has done and is doing. And I would ask you, what other significant area in your life are you satisfied? Are you just okay to kick back with 50% odds against you? Think about that for a minute, okay? Like if I told you, hey, there's a real chance you're going to get cancer. There's a 50% chance you could get cancer if you keep eating this particular brand of cereal. You would ditch that brand of cereal in a heartbeat and move on to something else, right? Or if I said, there's a 50% chance this week that all of your money, your bank money, your finances, right, every, all your investments, all your, those are going to disappear. They're going to be taken from you. Chances are you would take your money out of wherever it is and you would transfer. You'd put it somewhere safe. Or maybe if I said that there's a 50% chance that when you walk outside this building today, flesh-eating zombies are going to attack you. You'd probably find a different way out, Right? Right? There's no other area in our lives that we're okay with a 50% chance, with 50% odds stacked up against us. And yet our crazy culture basically says, hey, you can't even get a driver's license without taking a test, taking a class, spending at least six months and 50 hours behind the wheel of a car supervised. But yet you can go get a marriage license for 65 bucks in zero experience, right? That's our culture. That's crazy. So what's the issue? What is the kryptonite for 99% of our marriages? Well, I spoke with some of the marriage counselors I know this week. Uh, a few weeks ago, I look back at my own notes. I've done some, some premarital counseling. I've done some marital counseling. I look back at my own notes. And then I looked in the mirror. I looked at my own marriage. And the root issue behind all the other issues in marriage, the kryptonite to marriage, is self-centeredness. Self-centeredness. And by the way, this isn't just a kryptonite, again, to, to, to just marriage. This also applies to most other important relationships as well. So again, if you're not married, don't check out on me. Don't check out on me, all right? There is much wisdom and application to be had here in this message that, that apply to all relationships. So let's talk about self-centeredness, this idea that you first and foremost look out for you, that you need to meet your needs first and foremost, right? Those are what matter. Because if you don't look out for your needs, if you don't look out for your interests, your desires, who's going to? Who will, right? And we are all naturally self-centered, all of us. It comes to us almost as naturally as taking that next breath. Don't believe me? Let me show you real quick. When you look at a group photo, when you look at a group photo, who's the first person you look for? You look for you. You look for you. And you decide in a split second whether that photo is a good photo or not based solely on how you look in that picture, right? Like everybody else in the picture can look like they fell out the ugly tree that morning and hit every branch on the way down. Yet if you've got it going on, that's a good picture. That's a really good picture, right? We're just naturally self-centered. We think about our own life, the person's needs whom we're concerned with, number one, is our own. Because again, if you don't look out for you, who's going to do that? Who's going to handle that? Now, I want to show you this morning that while the kryptonite of self-centeredness may come instinctively to us, it absolutely kills a marriage. It kills a marriage. One of the marriage studies I read reported that self-centeredness might be the foundational problem in almost every divorce case that they studied. And I totally get that because self-centeredness is the root problem in, in my marriage. I mean, my wife Angela is so self-centered. She just is, right? It's a joke. It's a, it's a joke. Honey, if you're listening, I love you. It's a joke, right? Now, seriously, self-centeredness is one of those things that we really have a difficult time seeing in ourselves, yet the people around us, they usually can spot it pretty quick, pretty dead on, especially the people who are closer in, right? Now, if you've ever flown on an airplane and you've ever heard the little speech they give, the safety speech before you take off, where they, they, told, they tell you that in, in the case of an emergency, 
Those little oxygen masks will come down for you to use. Question, what are you supposed to do first if that happens? Are you supposed to put your mask on first and then help the person you're with? Or are you supposed to help the person you're with first and then put yours on? You're supposed to put yours on first and then help the person you're with, which seems a little counterintuitive at first. Here's my point. Whenever I preach and teach about marriage, whenever I I preach and teach about relationships, I notice husbands, wives, spouses, girlfriends, boyfriends, kids, they they get out the old Spanish arrow shooter, elbow, right? And the elbows are flying to one another, hands are being squeezed, saucy, snarky glances are being exchanged, right? All in an effort to kind of point out to the other person, hey, this is for you. This is totally you. You do this all the time. Pastor must have surveillance equipment up in our house because he knows you, right? I see it all the time. Problem is when we do this, we're kind of turning away. We're turning a blind eye to our own failures, to our own faults, to our own flaws while focusing on someone's, someone else's. In other words, we're trying to put on somebody else's oxygen mask and we haven't even touched ours yet, okay? Instead, we need to put on our oxygen mask first, And that looks like allowing God's word, allowing the Holy Spirit to do business with our hearts, with our minds first, as we kind of reflect on our thoughts, our feelings, our actions, our words, and how they've been self-centered in the recent past and kind of continue to be. That's first. So this message is for everyone, including me. My life has been very self-centered. My life has been very much focused on me. And there's two things that have really served in my life to kind of break up the streak of self-centeredness. And one of those things is having children, definitely having children. I had no idea how self-centered I was until we had our first child, until Emma came along, right? Now, when you get married, you're supposed to start thinking about the other person. You're supposed to start thinking about your spouse. But a lot of us, when we get married, we think, wow, Now instead of just one person thinking about me all the time, now there's two. This is great. I love this, right? But when you have kids, it just doesn't work that way anymore. Because when you have kids, when she comes out of the womb, she's not thinking about your needs. She's not thinking about the crazy she's about to drop on your life, right? She's crying about her own needs, So having children is one of the things, one of two things, that has really served to to kind of begin derailing the Sean train of self-centeredness in my life. There's another thing that's really even deeper than that, working to kind of unhinge and and help me build a tolerance to the kryptonite of self-centeredness in my life. It's the only thing I know of that has the power to really overcome the kryptonite of self-centeredness, and that is a love-driven truth-telling, grace-extending relationship with one another like Jesus has with us, the church. What did Jesus do for us? Well, the greatest one ever. He, He came down. He became the servant of all. The greatest one ever. He left the magnificence of heaven. He left the glory of heaven. And he came to this earth on a love mission, and he told us the truth about ourselves. Scary, right? He told us the truth about our sin. He told us the truth about our brokenness, about life, about our relationships. And then here's the good news. Then he gave up his life. He died on a cross so that you and I, so that we could have the amazing grace that's been freely offered to us. He literally died to his own self-interest so that he could focus on and look out for our needs, for our interests. That's the power of the gospel in your marriage. That the path to mutual fulfillment and joy is mutual self-sacrifice. Which is what we're going to kind of jump into today. I want to try and show you how the gospel is really the only superpower that can overcome the kryptonite of self-centeredness in your marriage and your relationships. See, we struggle with this. We struggle with relationships because we have this kind of needy sense of 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 clinginess, this needy sense of fear that drives us oftentimes to serve ourselves through the other relationships, through the other people around us. But God releases us from that. Because here's the truth. In Christ, through Christ, all of those fears, all of those insecurities, 
Those are handled. Those are taken care of. I guess what I'm trying to say is, in Christ, you can give up all you have because through Christ, you have everything you need. And I can be poor on earth because I'm rich in him. I can be overlooked on earth because I'm cherished by him. I could be absolutely nothing in your eyes because I'm something in his. In Christ, you can give up all you have or let go of all you have or release all you think you deserve because in Christ, you have everything you're ever going to need. In Christ, we have the satisfaction and the security that totally frees us and enables us to take our eyes off of ourselves and serve others. The Bible says it like this in Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So here's something I've learned. Here's something I've learned. Killing the kryptonite of self-centeredness and marriage literally means daily and actively focusing on the amazing grace that God through Jesus has shown us and then turning around and showing that grace to our spouse. That's what that looks like. And when both sides of a marriage practice that, when both sides of a marriage are intentional about that, the kryptonite of self-centeredness begins losing its power real fast. But how do you do that? What does that look like? Give me a snapshot. Give me something to do, right? Three ways that I found in my marriage, coming up on 15 years in August, in my marriage, and obviously through Scripture, and through a lot of trial and error, three ways I want to focus in on this morning. There's so much more, but I want to focus on these three. So the first thing that we do is we speak the truth in love. We speak the truth in love. Tell the truth in love. Ephesians 4.15 says it like this. Speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Now, it doesn't say to yell the truth in love, right? Hey, you left the toilet seat up again. No, that's yelling, right? It says to tell the truth in love. We tell the truth in love. A couple of kind of super practical things to remember under this point, speaking the truth in love, within your marriage that will really help kill the kryptonite of self-centeredness. Number one, speak the truth in love when the waters are calm. Speak the truth in love when the waters are calm. In other words, during non-conflict times, okay? That's the wisest time to bring up important issues, especially new ones that you haven't discussed yet. Proverbs 15.23 isn't on the screen, but it says this, joy is found in giving the right answer, and how good is a word spoken at the right time, Right? Timing can be everything. So, if your wife is chucking a shoe at you, probably not the best time to bring up a new issue, right? Wait a little bit. We work on these things during non-conflict times when the waters of marriage are calm. And the second way that we speak truth and love is we focus on the issue and not on our spouse. We attack the issue and not the person, right? We confront the root of the issue instead of hacking at the leaves, of the other person. I'll give you an example of how my wife Angela did this with me um, very recently. So we, we were leading a small group, right? And there were times where my wife Angela would share, right? And sometimes she would tell longer stories to, to kind of get to the point. And, I, and I'm going to say this. I don't know if anyone's ever said this before, but I thought of this last night. I'm like, my wife, like, like many women, she takes the back roads to get to her point. And it takes a little bit longer, right? You stop and you see some details and you unpack a little bit. It really doesn't have anything to do with where you're going, but you get there. Guys and me, we're on the expressway, man. Get me on the freeway and get me to where I'm going, right? And that's, that's okay. That's okay. But sometimes we were in this small group and she's doing, and I'm thinking, I'm being honest, I'm thinking, come on, come on, let's go. And then I acted on that. And I ended up interrupting her, taking the conversation over, and moving on to the next point. And apparently, I did this quite often. <laughs> because my wife, Angela, she did something that's very loving and very wise. First, let me tell you what she didn't do, what she did not do. She did not say anything in front of the group. That's number one, right? She didn't go, uh, excuse me, pastor man. Maybe you think what you have to say is way more important than what I'm sharing, but... I'm going to talk, right? 
she didn't do that. Because that's when small group gets really awkward. <laughs> right? Let's be real. All right? That's not what she did. What she did is she waited a few days. Right? She waited a few days after these incidents had happened. And she approached me when, when the waters of marriage were calm. And she said, she said something like this. She said, Sean, you're a great husband and I love you. And she listed some of the things in ministry she loves doing with me. She's like, I love these things about ministry life with you. And then she said, but there's one thing that you do that you probably don't realize that you're doing because if you did, you wouldn't do it because it's hurting me. It's hurting me. And she went on to say, she said, in our small group, whenever I'm talking about something important, whenever I'm sharing, a lot of times you'll interrupt me and you'll take the conversation over and you'll move on to another point. And she went on to talk about this for a little bit and then I interrupted her. Then I did it. Right? I tried to move on. She goes, there it is. You, you just did it, baby. I was like, yeah, I did, didn't I? Didn't I? See, the thing is, that was very effective communication to me because she affirmed me. She didn't attack me. She gave me the benefit of the doubt because my wife knows my heart. She knows that I wasn't out to hurt her. But it was still wrong. And she explained to me very clearly how it made her feel. She said, I know you don't want to make me feel this way. And she was right. She was right. After that, I started noticing when I was doing it or when I was tempted to do it, and I was able to stop doing it. That was way more effective than if she had brought it up in the middle of a conflict like, like oh, and another thing, during small group, right? Way more effective, right? Because when you do that, the wheels just come off and things break down very, very quickly. Very important, another piece of information, something else I've learned. She didn't keep this false sense of peace and pretend like everything was okay. She didn't do that. She didn't just let me walk all over her and then just kind of shut up and hold it in, okay? She didn't sweep it under the rug. And a lot of us, if we're honest this morning, if we really look at ourselves and our marriages, we've got some mountains under some rugs, don't we? got a lot of stuff we just kind of tucked aside and said you know what we don't talk about that we don't discuss that if we're going to kill the kryptonite of self-centeredness in our marriages we must be people who are intentional about speaking the truth in love very intentional people who love our spouse enough not to work around the issue but to go right through it together the second thing is this to kill the kryptonite of self-centeredness in marriage we need to be quick to apologize when we're wrong. Quick to apologize when we're wrong. James 5.16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you might be healed. This idea of confession, right, of telling one another what you've done wrong and asking for forgiveness, that's a regular, reoccurring, cyclical part of following Jesus. This side of heaven, it just is. How do we do this? How do we do this? What does that look like? Well, we admit to specific actions without excuses. The easiest way I can break it down, for myself too. We admit to specific acts. We say, here's what I did wrong. Here's where I messed up. And no excuses. In other words, we own our mess without justifying it. For some of us, that's excruciating to do. For many different reasons. What we don't dare say is, is baby, I am so sorry that I looked at something inappropriate. But if you had just met my needs in that area, I wouldn't have gone there in the first place. That's not an apology. That's pathetic. That's pathetic. We don't say, I'm so sorry that you're so oversensitive and you got your feelings hurt. That's not an apology, right? We don't say, oh honey, you know what? Earlier today, I'm so sorry I said all of those mean, awful, accurate things about your mother. <laughs> we don't do that. Guys, that's not an apology. Babe, I'm really sorry I belittled you in front of your friends. I should not have done that. That was wrong. That's an apology. Babe, I'm so sorry that I raised my voice at you like that. That was disrespectful. I shouldn't have done that. Honey, I'm so sorry I dropped the cat off the roof to see if it would land on all four feet. <laughs> shouldn't have done that. I didn't do that. I didn't do that, all right? Dovetailing into that through scripture and pain Here's something else I've learned, something else God taught me. There's a huge difference between remorse and repentance. 
huge difference between remorse and repentance. So often we just get to remorse and we stop. That's where we land, right? Kind of like this. Well, I'm sorry I got caught. Or, honey, I'm so sorry this is so hard for us, right? Or, I'm sorry you got your feelings hurt. That's remorse, right? Repentance is, I was wrong. I sinned, and I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. And then kind of tucking that experience away, not to beat ourselves over the head with later, no, but to learn from it, to grow from it, to move on. And when you sin, Don't stop with I'm sorry. Don't stop with I'm sorry. I'm sorry is for mistakes. Will you please forgive me? It's for sin. I'm sorry I left the toilet seat up again, honey. That's a mistake, okay? Will you please forgive me for deceiving you? That's a sin. That's a sin. Don't just stop at I'm sorry. When you've actually crossed that line and sinned against someone, will you please forgive me? So how do we begin killing the kryptonite of self-centeredness in marriage? We speak the truth in love. We apologize when we're wrong. And lastly, we forgive and we let go. We forgive and we let go. This is a tough one. I'm going to walk and I'm going I'm to tread into this very, very lightly because I realize that there are a lot of you. There are a lot of you that have a tremendous amount of pain in this area. Okay? Some of you right now might be thinking, man, you've got your little preacher life and your little preacher family and your little preacher marriage. You have no idea what I've been through. And I just want to say, I may not have been through what you've been through, and I don't pretend to have been. But I do understand that betrayal, betrayal is very, very difficult to forgive. I get that. I understand. Some of you, you've been betrayed. Your spouse betrayed you. They committed adultery. They cheated on you, maybe more than once. And you just kind of left with your head in your hands going, I can't even process that, let alone begin to forgive them for that. Others of you, you were married to someone. You were in a deep relationship with someone, and you gave them everything. (laughs) And they just kind of, through, through circumstances and situations and selfish choice, they bailed on you. They were supposed to be ride or die, and they bailed. And you're left holding the bag, going, really? Forgiveness? That's not even on my radar. Let me throw this at you, though. Let me say this. I'm not here to tell you that forgiveness is easy. It's not. It's not. But I am here to tell you it's doable. It's doable. And it's incredibly important. It's foundational, actually, if we're going to kill the kryptonite of self-centeredness in marriage. The Bible tells us like this. Colossians 3, among other places, says, Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Ephesians 4.32 says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ Jesus, God forgave you. So if you follow Jesus this morning, if you're a Christ follower, you're a Christian, I have to ask you a question. Has God forgiven you of many things? I don't know about you, but God's forgiven me of a lot. God's forgiven me of a lot. Has the Lord forgiven you freely? Freely, even though you don't deserve it, even though there's nothing you could ever do to earn it. That's how we're called to forgive. To freely forgive as we've been forgiven. I know personally how critical this kind of forgiveness is to a marriage. Because I'm the one who blew it. I'm the one who messed up. I'm the one who found myself at year seven looking at my marriage with two little kids going, I don't know if we're going to make it. We've been through some stuff, but this is big. And I'm responsible. Long story short, I developed a drug addiction to opiate-based pain medication. And this isn't when I'm 18, this isn't when I'm a kid, this isn't in college. 
This is 32 years old, full-time ministry, two babies at home, leading a church. And I took the rabbit hole deep. I took it deep into lies, theft, a, a double life. Pastor, dad, husband on the outside. Lying, stealing, deceiver on the inside. I lived like that for three years. Three years. And the day before Thanksgiving, 2011, I didn't hit rock bottom so much as I face planted in it. And I asked my wife last, last weekend, last Saturday night, I said, babe, walk me through again. What was going through your heart and your mind as you looked at this mess of a husband and a mess of a marriage and decided what you were going to do? And I wrote it down because I wanted to get it right. She said, I had to know, regardless of whether you and I made it or not, that God and I were going to. She said that meant trusting him and following his lead by forgiving you and being patient. So I speak from experience on the other side. When I tell you with all that I have that no matter how little or how long you've been married, the transforming love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ it can save you and it can save your marriage. I've seen it in my life and I've seen it in the lives of others in beautiful ways. So if you need encouragement in your marriage, a couple practical things and then I'll pray for us and shut up. A couple practical things. We're going to be starting a field group here at this campus. We already have one that's been running for years at our other campus for married couples. It's been wildly successful. It's not a counseling session. It's for married couples who just want to kind of walk with and be encouraged by, loved by, prayed over by other people doing life and being married, right? We're going to start that up in the fall. You're going to have an opportunity to sign up for it. We'll talk more about that as we move closer to that time. But right now, if you're in a place where you're like, man, I'm 10 feet under and upside down. I have no idea what's, what I'm doing. I don't even know what to do next. Like after this service, I don't know whether I'm going home with him or her or, or I'm going to go drive around for a few hours or I'm going to go to my parents' house with a bag. If that's where you're at or you're close to that point, Scott and I both have some great Christ-centered marital counseling options for you. If you want to sit down and talk to somebody, whether it's alone to begin with or with your spouse, which is always the goal, See me after service. I'm not going to use you as a sermon illustration. I'm not going to tell anybody. There's confidence here. Ask anyone who I've met with or counseled with. Nothing ever comes back. That's not how we roll. But I will plug you in. I will help you. I will connect you with somebody. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for a place like Velocity. Beth Lytic said it all, God, before the sermon even started. A place where we can come and find healing, a safe place where regardless of where we're at on our faith journey, whether we're, we're a believer and, man, we, we fell out the womb in church or, or we are brand new to this whole God thing and, and what's the Bible all about and Jesus, I don't know. I thought he was just a good guy. Wherever we're at in that spectrum, we have a safe place we can come and ask questions. Thank you for that. Where we can come and we can learn we can have a conversation with some people and maybe push back or be honest about our, our doubts and our frustrations and our, our past. Thank you for a place like that that does away with so many of the obstacles to your grace. So much of the red tape that we find in so many other places in this culture. Thank you for that. And I pray that anybody in the sound of my voice, whether here in person or listening on the podcast right now, who's in that place where they're not sure what they're going to do in their marriage, would make a phone call, send a text, an email, just grab me, say, hey, I need help. Take advantage of the first step towards reconciliation.
and wholeness. In Jesus' name, through the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray.